So, okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, as some of you are all will know, my name is Frank Rude. I'm the program lead here for the philosophy program at the University of Dundee. And I'm very happy uh, in the name of that program and in the name of the Scottish Centre for Continental Philosophy um, to welcome our guest for this evening's, well, I mean, his mornings, but our evening's um, uh, event, namely Todd McGowan. Um, it's a real delight and pleasure to have Todd with us. I'm going to, as is usual, I'm going to be brief in introducing him so that we can spend our time rather listening to him and um, um, engaging with him um, afterwards. Um, that will work, as you will all know, in the uh, 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 just trivial and ordinary manner. You can, um, I will monitor the chat uh, throughout the event since you can put your uh, comments or whatever um, or questions in and I will try to pick them up one by one afterwards. But you can also raise your um, tiny electronic, what is it, uh, hands or fingers. I mean, don't raise anything else but those. Um, um, and um, so let me briefly, briefly say a couple of words um, um, about Todd. Todd McGowan is Professor of Film Studies at the University of Vermont. I think with his work, Todd has in recent years created quite an enormous and uh, remarkable and justifiably so reputation for himself as someone who is able to bring together major theoretical figures, at least in some of his works, but major theoretical figures like Hegel, Marx, or Freud. And, and he seeks to demonstrate and is able to demonstrate how their ideas manifest, appear, and are elucidated in and by films, television series, and in and by other media formats. Um, he has written books on comedy, capitalism, and various filmmakers, such as Only a Joke Can Save Us, A Theory of, a theory of Comedy, Capitalism and Desire, The Psychic Cost of Free Markets, The Impossible David Lynch, the fictional Christopher Nolan, and most recently, Universe, uh, Universality and Identity Politics, that's 2020, and Emancipation After Hegel, Achieving a Contradictory Revolution, that's 2019. I think especially his work on psychoanalytic film theory elaborated quite a novel, a genuinely novel way of thinking about the relationship between us engaging with the film and um, the, let's say, almost ontological status of the cinematographic uh, image itself. So he will today speak as is common for about an hour, and then we move into the discussion part um, for about, I don't know, 55 minutes or something like that, because Todd, um, um, and this makes you um, uh, see how kind he is, will directly afterwards um, um, uh, go and have to teach. Todd will speak today about enjoying right and left, and thank you so much for agreeing to be with us here, at least virtually. The floor or maybe the virtual space is yours. Frank, thanks so much for inviting me and thanks for that generous, uh, the generous introduction. Way too generous. Uh, and I, I'm really delighted that you began with my book on comedy, which most often gets elided because that's my favorite, the favorite thing I've done. And, and hopefully uh, it'll integrate itself into this discussion as well. So I, I, I'm taking as the point of departure and my the thesis of my uh, talk is this, that political struggles take place to determine what form of enjoyment will predominate. So that's the basic idea. And so I, I think, although it seems initially pretty distant from politics, when we recognize what's at stake in enjoyment, I think uh, this claim seems less outlandish, less bizarre, that because enjoyment's not just pleasure. It's not simply, say, the experience of eating an ice cream cone or buying a new car. Instead, it's something like continuing to eat ice cream cones after one is full or buying a new car that one cannot afford and that drives one into bankruptcy. So it's we enjoy what is not useful, what's not good for us, what's not good for our health, what's not good for our well-being. So enjoyment, you might say, is pleasure taken to the point that it becomes ruinous for us. But at the same time, this experience of enjoyment provides a reason to keep going in life. So it's the motivation to get out of bed in the morning and engage with the world. When we enjoy, I think we touch on what exceeds everyday life. And in, in a way, we find the secret sauce that makes this everyday life bearable for us. So enjoyment's always excessive. It's always not just what's pleasing, but, but crucially, I think, what's, what's disturbing, what, what bothers us. So it manifests itself in things like ecstatic religious experience, devotion to a favorite sports team. This is maybe my 
personal favorite form of enjoyment that's most close to the close to my heart uh the dedication to an unhealthy food i also like this one uh the passion for a lover who portends certain heartbreak i'm a little more immune to this uh the excesses of enjoyment don't confine themselves to personal life unlike these examples but actually i think define the political field as well so we see this enjoyment in massive political rallies vehement protests and even sometimes in outbursts of revolutionary or reactionary fervor. So enjoyment is not just, I want to claim a large quantity of pleasure, but pleasure that undergoes a transformation so that it becomes painful for us to bear. So pleasures can, I think, be strictly pleasurable without any inner of pain, but one has to suffer one's enjoyment. So enjoyment involves giving oneself excess trouble or creating excess excitation for oneself, whereas pleasure as Roy defines it, and I, I like his definition, it occurs with the elimination of excess excitation, excess stimulation. So this excessiveness of enjoyment, I think is what gives it its political radicality. So it takes us out of everyday existence, out of the everyday. It's because enjoyment goes beyond the possibilities present for me in my everyday social position, it troubles not only me, but also the social order itself. And this is where I think the political edge of it lies. So the way that, a, say, a political protest might interfere with the flow of traffic stands as a nice synecdoche for the disruptiveness of enjoyment. So enjoyment involves going beyond the, the constraints of the givens of a social order in a way that I think pleasure doesn't. So it might be pleasant to drive fast, but it's enjoyable to block the traffic flow for the sake of protesting some new law, some new, new fuel tax, let's say, if you have a red, sorry, a yellow vest, that was a funny slip. Uh, fast drivers keep things moving, it's a good leftist slip. Uh, fast drivers keep things moving while protests bring things to a stop. Or we might say pleasure fits while enjoyment doesn't. So this gives enjoyment this radical political charge relative to pleasure, which, pleasure that is always relies on leaving things as they are. So politics is what gives a form for our enjoyment. So political campaigns, I think, offer the promise of some specific form of enjoyment to those who support them. And this is what energizes the support. This is why people get so invested in political campaign, political struggle. It provides a way of organizing enjoyment so that the possibility for this enjoyment appears maximized or the threat that others pose to it appears minimized. I think that's really important that it's not just maximizing my own enjoyment, it's minimizing the threat that others uh, represent for it. So enjoyment actually plays a determinative role, I think, in what society looks like. So one political leader, let's say, might allow people to take pride in and enjoy their nation by ridding it of outsiders, that might be the program, Another might offer the enjoyment of collective sacrifice to fight climate change. A third might propose a completely transformative move of society by turning capitalism into some kind of communist alternative. Not so much today. Uh, a social order's political structure emerges out of a struggle, I want to claim, between competing forms of enjoyment such as these. And the struggle itself, I think, reveals the nature of these of, of these competing forms of enjoyment. So, so we don't have to wait for what the realization of the political program is to grasp the operative form of enjoyment. Instead, we can see it in the struggle itself, in the form that the struggle takes. So every political position that people take up already demonstrates, I think, the form of enjoyment that they hope will prevail. So how one enjoys, I think, defines how one functions as a political actor. So. I want to quickly take a look at the 2020 presidential election in the United States. I, I don't. I hope to not be too parochial, but I know that this is a. This was followed around the world, but I, and I think it's actually mirrored in other global contexts. In fact, you could even translate this into uh, Macron Zemmour in, uh, in in France at this present moment. So, so Trump promised to sustain a nationalist and ethnocentric enjoyment that he success, successfully, I think, unleashed in his one term as president. So. He organized enjoyment through this slogan, everyone knows it, make America great again. By the way, I was gonna wear, 
the hat and but I I wouldn't have been able to cross the campus at the University of Vermont and I would have lost my job so I I I I, I don't have a hat but I, I was thinking of buying it just for the talk just to to demonstrate but I think it just shows the way in which that that even that piece of garb really embodies the enjoyment to such an extent that it, it's it's simply not allowed at the University of Vermont. Uh, but this 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 slogan, this hat, enjoyed uh, sorry uh, enjoined allowed partisans to enjoy the excesses of the American nation, to bask in the nation's worst transgressions without any apology, and to believe in their racial superiority. So it was it was clearly there was a racial tinge to it. So Trump licensed acting without regard for the limitations that govern the social order. So as a Trump supporter, one could do what? One could beat up protesters with impunity. One could identify with racist police violence, or one could wear this baseball hat that was certain to offend polite liberal society. So there's a, as you, like you wear a hat, there's no, like I'm wearing this hat today, there's no, unfortunately, there's no jouissance enjoyment factor in it. But for the, the MAGA hat, the Make America Great Again hat, there is that. Uh, so even just wearing a hat becomes a source of enjoyment. To identify with Trump was also to enjoy his transgressions. And this is why I think it's, he, he's a very interesting figure in this way and different than Zimmer, I think, that, that one could vicariously, I'm quoting him, grab them by the pussy. One could swindle investors. One could hobnob with celebrities like Tom Brady. One could do what? One could insult one's enemies without repercussions. And even, I think this is a nice little added part, one could partake in incestuous comments about his daughter's sex appeal, right? Which were just incredible, really. But I think that those weren't things that, again, I think a lot of people have said this, these weren't things that counted against him, but why didn't they count against him? They count, didn't count against him because they increased the enjoyment factor of supporting him. So his own transgressions actually turned him into a source of enjoyment for his followers and in no way detracted from his appeal, but were central to it because they provided a way for these supporters to enjoy in a way they otherwise couldn't. And I think his policies interestingly aligned with that because they pushed this enjoyment even further. So when demonstrators marched against police violence toward the end of his first term, only term so far in office in 2020, Trump's response was to refuse to authorize, of course, any change in policing strategies, to blame the protesters for causing problems, to embrace those who shot protesters, and to call for harsher treatment of suspects. So excessive policing actually provided enjoyment for Trump's followers. We're now having a trial about this guy, Kyle Rittenhouse, who did shoot. Um, he may be acquitted in, as I'm speaking. So it's an interesting uh, interesting follow-up to this, this, this question. Uh, so so, it, so this, this, this policing, excessive policing provide enjoyment. Why? Because it's a necessary violence violence that goes beyond what's necessary for the police officer to use and control the situation. So the excessive police violence gave Trump supporters a path to enjoyment that they wouldn't have they would not have had without him and without his embrace of the unruly illegal policing. So this excess also controlled the barrier and this is something really crucial to the right wing form of enjoyment. It controlled the barrier between those who belonged and those who didn't. So that idea of controlling that barrier, policing the barrier between belonging and non-belonging is, I think, what defines a right-wing enjoyment. It's dependent upon that barrier. So the violence created belonging for Trump devotees because it forced others into the position of non-belonging. So those drawing attention, say, to the nation's racism or poverty rates revealed for the followers of Trump that they didn't properly, properly belong to American society. So Trump organized the enjoyment of his supporters around the belonging of these supporters, which required highlighting that others didn't belong. So that's the really crucial point. So anyone mentioning, taking note of the nation's failures helped to constitute the group of Trump supporters precisely by providing these outsiders whom the group could enjoy hating. So their enjoyment depended on someone occupying the position of non-belonging on the outside, someone who wouldn't fit within the social field and thus could serve as a site of enjoyment. So it's interesting that the enjoyment comes from those who are non-belonging outside, even though they're serving to make the group of those who belong. So the key is that those on the right didn't just disagree with their political opponents, but they actually experienced a feverish, enjoyable animus towards them. So this feverish animus was, I wanna say the political enjoyment of the right. 
an enjoyment that manifests itself in, you hear these terms all the time here, I don't know about around the world, owning the libs, bashing political correctness, and now the most recent form is uh, attacking what they call CRT or critical race theory. So the Make America Great Again movement needed enemies who were holding America back from this supposed return to greatness. Otherwise the movement itself would lose its raison d'etre. So it wouldn't have any reason to be and it would lose also its mode of enjoying. So it enjoyed through those it despised and through their position of non-belonging. And Trump promised the nation uh, an enjoyment of an ethnic, hom ethnically homogenous society that had clear enemies in the advocates of say political correctness or against police violence. So this term political correctness had a broad signification. It meant for him anything that spoke to impugn the history of the United States or the racist structure of American society. So you're being politically correct in Trump's idiom if you got in the way of any real unapologetic American enjoyment with qualms about the nation's actions or about those of its designated heroes. The irony, I think, for Trump's form of enjoyment, again, like all right-wing forms of enjoyment, is that it depends upon those who it vilifies in order to nourish it. So right-wing enjoyment is fundamentally parasitic. And we can see an example of this, I think, in the fight against those who wanted to remove statues commemorating Confederate war hero. So the, the, the American Civil War and the, 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 the devotion to the heroes of the South was a, an integral part of this form of enjoyment. So to take down Confederate statues, which was part of this movement in, in 2020 and even just prior to that, but to take them down was to impede American enjoyment by damaging the ability to enjoy the excess of America's slaveholding past. So no one among Trump's supporters cared about the statues is interesting until someone tried to take them down. So conservatives weren't flocking to pay homage to the statue of Robert E. Lee or Jefferson Davis or any of these Confederate leaders prior to this attempt to, to knock them down. So the statues had no value. No one took pleasure in their aesthetic beauty, such that it was, but their excessiveness, their celebration of a past that no one could logically or morally defend gave them an enjoyment value. So again, it's, it's the way in which they stick out, the way they don't fit gives them this enjoyment value, but it becomes clear only when they're attacked, that the enjoyment value becomes palpable when the detractors threaten the continued display of the statues or actually bring them down. And that occasioned a very famous rally that I'll talk about in a second. So the enjoyment value sent conservatives, conservative activists marching into the streets to preserve them. And had the statues only provided pleasure, I want to contend, no one would have protested their removal. So the enjoyment that Trump promised and proffered required an enemy, such as those taking down the statues. And the, the enemy gives the conservative a position on which to find its own excessiveness. So it finds the excessiveness through the figure of the enemy. In response to Trump's ethnically homogenous nationalism, Joe Biden initially appeared to offer a different way of structuring enjoyment. So there's something, something new, something different. Uh, so for Biden, there was enjoyment simply in returning to normal, which meant, of course, simply returning to the capitalist American society before the Trump presidency. And his statement to, Amer to European leaders, America's back, I think typified, really typified this position. While just returning to normal seems to be a position relatively bereft of enjoyment, Biden's candidacy actually reconstituted normality and in a way that brought tears of enjoyment to people when it triumphed. I, my my uh, girlfriend from high school emailed me and she's like, I was just, she wasn't even a, she wasn't even a Democrat. She was a Republican. And she emailed me, she was like, I couldn't stop crying when Biden was elected. <laughs> that was the last I heard it from her. I don't know what that means. Uh, so normality became a site of transcendent enjoyment after the Trump years when corruption and prevarication functioned as the norm, right? So despite his overall pedestrian qualities as a candidate, or maybe even because of these qualities, Biden came to embody the perfect alternative to the form of enjoyment Trump offered. He presented people with their old political system as a new form of enjoyment, which led to Trump's defeat, uh, or as Trump calls it, the big steal. Uh, so uh, his conjuration of restored normality as a way of organizing enjoyment managed, to, managed for a time to win more adherence than Trump's 
fervent nationalism. But Biden, I think, wasn't really so different from Trump as this account might suggest. Well, of course, he doesn't have Trump's racist nationalism and overt corruption, for sure. He took attack remarkably similar to Trump by focusing on an enemy. So one could promise the enjoyment of a return to normal only if one had a figure of abnormality to fight against, right? This figure, who was it? It was Trump himself, right? Trump became the outsider destroying the American system that Biden and his followers could enjoy hating. So to support Biden was to enjoy through the excesses of Trump. And this is one reason why Biden's support cratered. I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's utterly cratered now. It's lower than Trump's even was. Uh, soon, it cratered soon after Trump's defeat. So the unifying figure, the enemy that served as the source of enjoyment had disappeared. So although the contest between the enjoyment that Trump offered and what Biden counters with appears to have high stakes, the contest actually doesn't illustrate the divide between the forms of enjoyment that characterize right and left. So the, the existence of Biden as an alternative, I think, reveals, sadly, the, the bankruptcy of the contemporary left, not just in the United States, but I think we see this almost everywhere around the world. So while Trump might adequately represent a rightist form of enjoyment, I think he does. Biden does not provide a, relative, a revelatory leftist counterexample. He just doesn't. The structure and and Maybe there's someone else in American political scene that does, which I'll, I'll get to. The structure of enjoyment that he advocates bears too much of a resemblance, I think, to that of his opponent. His invocation of a return to normality falls short of a leftist mobilization that we might see in the work, uh, see, see at work, sorry, in, in the Haiti of Toussaint Louverture, the Bolivia of Evo Morales, or even the movement surrounding Bernie Sanders here in the United States. So there are radical differences between the structure of right and left enjoyment that this opposition between Trump and Biden or Zamora and Macron in France doesn't, or off day and, 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 and whoever ends up being the, the winner in Germany doesn't capture. So in other words, we have to look beyond electoral battles if we wanna see the different structures of enjoyment that conservative and emancipatory politics, political movements offer. So by understanding the difference between right and left is the difference between competing forms of enjoyment. I think we can make sense of why right-wing movements seem to do such a better job of mobilizing people's emotions and why left-wing movements always seem ready to collapse. So the advantages of the right, I think, are not just institutional. The fact that obviously the forces of conservatism own the means of production, but they're tied to the form of enjoyment that the right accesses. But I think despite these structural advantages, the right actually operates with an enjoyment that it cannot universalize in direct con contrast with that of the enjoyment of the left, which is inherently universalist. So right-wing enjoyment is necessarily provincial because it relies on an outsider that threaten it, threatens it. So the threatening outsider is not a contingent development that the rightist encounters, but the sine qua non of right-wing enjoyment. The conservative position enjoys through this threat, which is why right-wing leaders constantly belabor the dangers posed by outsiders more than their own positive political programs. I was talking to a Vermont state representative in the hallway just uh, prior to this talk, and he just said, I can't believe these Republicans, they, they never have a political program of their own, they just bash. And I'm like, that's of course, that's the point. That's the form of enjoyment that they're offering. So their, pl their plans are empty of enjoyment though, without this outsider that threatens to undo them. So they need the threat, otherwise they found her, right? So due to this formal requirement, rightist enjoyment structurally excludes the possibility of bringing everyone together under a conservative umbrella. For this position to deliver the enjoyment that drives it, someone has to play the heavy and not belong. I think this is really crucial for me. So every conservative project demands an enemy in order to make it appealing to its adherents. Unlike the right, the left need not keep anyone out of the enjoyment that it offers. Leftist enjoyment is intrinsically universalizable. So despite their different forms, both right and left enjoyment have the same origin. So every social order has contradictions that create points that appear impossible to inhabit from within the order itself. And enjoyment derives from these contradictions because they provide avenues for people to transcend the limits that the society lays down. So we're not just confined to the possibilities that the social order offers us and makes available to us. So to enjoy then is to do something like eclipse 
the given possibilities that the social order has available. And the contradictions of every social order, you could say create openings to enjoy, openings to go beyond what's been authorized. Or another way to put it is enjoyment is an imminent transcendence, not an experience of the divine, not transcendent in that sense, but one in which we transcend the limits that the social order establishes as the constraints on the possible. So the, the social order is constructed in such a way that certain positions cannot register in its accounting. That there's no possible social order that allow, can account for everything. Certain positions simply don't exist as social possibilities, but these social impossibilities actually represent places where we can enjoy. For instance, let me just give a basic, really easy example, which I, is helpful to me, and I apologize for the simplicity of it. But the fundamental contradiction of a, a, a standard sexist society is to conceptualize the figure of the woman as both a non-sexual maternal figure and as a sex object. So sexism operates through this division of the woman into two contradictory identities. So if one is a non-sexual maternal figure, one cannot simultaneously be a sex object. So the two identities mutually exclude each other. And yet sexist society constitutes female identity through these two identities, which puts all women, all women in a contradictory position. That's the contrary situation, contradictory situation. So sexist ideology attempts to deal with this contradiction how? By dividing women into two camps. There's mothers on the one side, there's sex objects on the other. So in this way, the contradiction becomes an opposition between two different types of people. And I think this, I would just, my own little theory of ideology is that's what ideology does. It turns contradictions into opposition. So some are mothers, some are sex objects. So the contradiction becomes obscured in the particular differences between women, although the contradiction remains a problem that every woman has to address and confront. So the social order's fundamental contradiction creates a point of impossibility. What would it be in this case? The maternal sex object, right? The person that does, doesn't choose, that is both of these things. So to occupy this contradictory position is to exceed the, conf the confines and the limits, the, the positions available in sexist society. And it's such excess that opens up enjoyment. The emancipatory position, the stance of leftist enjoyment, I want to say is to occupy the contradiction that leftist, less that leftism discovers universality in the social contradiction where there is no recognition, no authorization. And this contradictory position is universal because it's available to everyone regardless of their social status or political power that in a certain sense, everyone is in this position of, of the contradiction or of non-belonging. So this point of impossibility is socially impossible, but of course it's not ontologically impossible, which is why it is possible to run into sexualized mothers even in a very sexist society. The position that sexist society deems impossible is actually a real possibility, a position that one can take up in defiance of the prevailing social mandates, right? So within any social order, one can do the impossible and occupy the position that the social order deems impossible. But by because occupying the impossible position brings the social contradiction to light, what happens? It entails ostracism and reprobation. So sexist society lab labels the sexualized mother, what? Unfit, abomination, or even a slut, right? So, or people who have brought, who have bought into the society collectively police it by looking at her askance, trying to discipline her into some kind of authorized identity. So such assaults, I think, indicate the threat that those who embrace the contradiction and occupy the impossible position pose to the oppressive social structure. Those who take up the position of say, the maternal sex object in sexist society occupy this society's contradiction and do the impossible. Embracing the contradiction in this way, I think frees one from the dictates of social authority and it frees one to do what to enjoy. It frees one to enjoy. So enjoyment is possible in every social order because no social order is coherent and complete. Each is lacking. Each is beset by contradictions that emerge through the drive to constitute itself and become whole. If it were coherent, formed without any fissures, a social order would actually have no way to admit new members, which is obviously a requirement for every society, even that of the American group, the Shakers, who disdained sexual reproduction, but they still were invested in social reproduction. So in this sense, 
the limitations of the social order are necessary because they create the opening for new members, but they also provide the site for challenges to the order and for what I want to call leftist enjoyment. So a society constitutes itself as a whole by creating a barrier between itself and what's external to it. But the contrast between this contrast between inside and outside is obviously essential for any social order, any society. And it manifests itself through the determination of belonging. So a society depends on recognizing those who belong and withholding recognition from those who don't in order to define itself. And this, defining, this dividing line between belonging and non-belonging must exist to grant recognition and determine who belongs. But this is where I think the contradiction opens up the possibility for enjoyment. And the contradiction creates a space that doesn't fit within this regime of signification or what I call before a space of imminent transcendence. So there's a contradiction within every social order due to the status of the authority that polices belonging. So the social order that doles out recognition or belonging has its authority through the recognition of the members that the members of society give to it. So an authority is an authority insofar as most people in the society treat it as one. Even in democratic countries, it's not the vote that authorizes the leader. Instead, it's the collective belief in the validity of the vote or whatever process determines who the authority will be. Although the people don't cons consciously make a collective decision to endow someone with authority, their authorization is, I think, nonetheless a necessary condition for the erection of a figure of social authority. And I think this is the basic contradiction, right? So the social authority that distributes recognition must itself be recognized by those to whom it grants recognition. So there's a kind of infinite regress that emerges and prevents any social authority from actually having an authorized status. So the authority's authorization comes from those whom the authority itself recognizes as having the power to authorize the authority. Sorry for the convoluted nature of that sentence, but it I think captures the contradictory status of every authority. So as a result, there's no one with the authority to litigate between belonging and non-belonging to, to decide, in other words, who belongs, who doesn't belong. So this line between inside and outside has to be drawn, but there's no one authorized to draw it because that no one authorized to draw it that doesn't ultimately receive their authorization from an unauthorized source. So I think this is really the basic contradiction that haunts every social order. And, and kind of, it, it's, it's the root of, say, that contradiction I described between the maternal and the sex object, right? It's even, it's, you can trace the link, the, 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 the through line from one to the other. I, I wouldn't want to claim that. So the contradiction creates a porous social order, one populated by holes of non-belonging that always undermine its coherence, no matter how tightly bound up it is. So no one, no one can be sure of belonging because there's no authorized authority that could ensure this belonging. And as a result, one's social identity is never secure, but always in question. So one's place within society is never certain, but always on the verge of being lost. And this means that I think everyone within the social order is virtually, not concretely, but virtually in the space of the sexualized mother within sexist society, that is in the position of non-belonging, but people cling to the illusion of belonging in order to confront, sorry, avoid confronting this actuality. Everyone relies on an unauthorized authority, but few admit this to themselves. They cling instead to, I think, this apparent security that resides in belonging. But again, all belonging is ultimately illusory. And it's the unauthorized status of social authority that leaves the members of society without any assurance of their belonging. So I strive to belong, but no recognition or validation can assure me that I've fully achieved it. So I'm stuck trying to belong, but never certain whether I do or not. And I think rather than being something to lament, it's precisely this failure to belong that opens up the possibility for enjoyment. So if one could belong to a social order and know that one received recognition from society, then this recognition would rule out enjoyment. So full recognition in the society would entail the complete evacuation of enjoyment. And enjoyment derives, you'd say this other way, from the failure of enjoyment, from the point at which the social order ceases to authorize one's position or what I've called the point of contradiction. So contradiction is just to put another way, the essence of enjoyment, that it's the, the key to enjoyment. It's through the empty spaces in the social order that contradiction opens up, that subjects are able to enjoy themselves. And since enjoyment is always the experience of excess, it, go, it occurs when one goes beyond 
the socially authorized space and takes up a position that doesn't fit within the map of the social order. So despite its clear appeal, I think we don't enjoy belonging and recognition, although of course we can take pleasure in them, right? So belonging and recognition confine us within a symbolic identity and strip away all potential for autonomy. So there's a link I think between enjoyment and freedom, which is pretty interesting. So there's no enjoyment in fitting in. We enjoy the failure of the social order, the inability to fit in, the points at which we can go beyond the options that society lays out for us and inhabit this unauthorized space of non-belonging. So you could say all enjoyment emerges out of non-belonging from occupying the position of not fitting. So I think the space for enjoyment exists because the structure of language that undergirds the social order centers around what can't be represented. So language doesn't aim at naming what we can perceive, but what we can't. There's a hole within every language that marks this fundamental absence. So the paradox of language holds, I think, the key to making sense how the space of, of how the space of enjoyment emerges within the structure of signification. And Richard Boothby, I think, has a nice statement about this. He says, the innermost essence of language functions to evoke something that is missing in the object. In its most primordial function, language serves to name the no thing. What is profoundly, what prof most profoundly sets speech in motion is a dimension of absence in perception, a lack that haunts perceptual presence, a dimension of perception that remains uncognizable. So the impossible that can't be represented is a structural necessity for language and thus for the social order. So it's precisely this point of impossibility that highlights what gives our existence its worth. So the point this point creates the opening for enjoyment, which occurs where the structure is at odds with what it can account for and with what, what, for what, goes, with what goes on. So enjoyment emerges, you could say, when what cannot happen does happen. And I, I think I like this statement because the contradiction of it, I think, shows how enjoyment is linked to contradiction and relies on it, depends on it. So the social order formally rules something out, deems it contradictory, and that's where enjoyment emerges. So the field of possibilities in any society always involves a contradiction and enjoyment is the experience of this impossible position. And I think the genuine political act has to occupy this position of the impossible. Although many political struggles seem to involve conflicting possibilities like more or less taxes, universal private health care, increased military spending or money for the homeless. The real political struggle focuses on what the social order characterizes as impossible. And to do the impossible is to break from the field of given possibilities within a society and to change the social coordinates. And when a political act accomplishes this, it achieves a transcendence relative to the field of possibilities that generates enjoyment, but that's the site of enjoyment. And I think Frantz Fanon in, in his theorization of decolonial struggle nicely talks about several occasions when he sees the impossible happening, when colonized subjects refuse a subservient position that the colonizer wants to put them in. And this is for Fanon, the essence of the fight against colonialism. By refusing the possibilities that colonialism presents, the colonized subject does what appears to be impossible according to the structure of colonial relations. And this is what he says in Wretched of the Earth. He says the colonized subject discovers that his or her life, his or her breathing, heartbeats are the same as the colonists. They discover that the skin of the colonists is not worth more than the natives. In other words, the world receives a fundamental jolt. So occupying the position of the impossible, that of equality for the colonized subject, brings with it the enjoyment of the impossible. The enjoyment comes as a jolt, as Fanon says, for the oppressing colonizer, but also a jolt for the colonized subject subjects themselves. So to do the impossible in this sense is to occupy the fundamental point of contradiction within the social order. So colonial society deems the colonized unequal to the colonizer, but at the same time, the colonizers trumpet a creed of human equality. So when the colonized actually assert their equality, they make this contradiction evident, as Fanon nicely points out. And he shows that the enjoyment of occupying the contradictory point within colonial society is actually a leftist enjoyment that portends the end of that society. So occupying this position is an enjoyable accomplishment of the impossible. So this doing the impossible always creates a psychic disturbance. 
it's it's a it's a it's the effect of a radical the enjoyment of the impossible you could say is the enjoyment of a radical disruption and because of the emergence of this through disruption through because of its emergence through this disruption of the established social order enjoyment i think seems to tilt inherently to the left that enjoyment marks a threat to the ruling order because it doesn't fit properly within that order but of course, the problem is that disruption isn't always emancipatory. The right is also able to marshal enjoyment for conservative or even reactionary purposes as easily as, maybe more easily than, the left does so for the sake of emancipation. So the right can take the disruptiveness of, of enjoyment and use it to further a sense of belonging for some, as long as there are others who don't belong. But the leftist or emancipatory project is the embrace of a radical enjoyment of contradiction and the enjoyment of non-belonging. I think that's the that's how I define it. That's what's crucial to me. So this is visible, I think, in leftist movements throughout human history, from the Spartacus revolt in ancient Rome to the Haitian Revolution to the Russian Revolution to the Dalit movement, Buddhist movement in India to the Zapatista movement in Mexico to Black Lives Matter in the contemporary United States. So the emancipatory emancipatory project focuses on privileging the fact of non-belonging and taking this non-belonging as the model. For the enjoyment that it proffers. So those who don't belong to the society and receive no recognition become the focus of leftist enjoyment. And it's from the perspective of emancipation, these figures of non-belonging are not the exceptions to the rule, but the paradigm for all subjectivity. So the subject is actually defined by its failure to belong, its inability to fit in within the assigned place that the social order lays out. So the failure is actually what opens up the possibility of enjoyment. But those who attempt to belong to the social order, or believe they belong, they flee their subjectivity into the promised coherence, the promised coherent stability of a symbolic identity, which is precisely what's denied to the figures of non-belonging, such as the colonized in Algeria, where Fanon, of course, was fighting for independence. So whether it's slaves in Haiti or Dalits in India, emancipa emancipation recognizes that non-belonging actually harbors all of the social order's enjoyment. And it's not an exceptional position that we should strive to eliminate, but the basic form of enjoying subjectivity that becomes obfuscated in those who strive to belong. So even though the people who are reduced to non-belonging have no social advantages and suffer tremendous oppression, they make evident the limits of the social order that emerge through its contradictions. So enjoyment emanates from a position of non-belonging that the social order does not recognize. It's not just a it's not just that particular figures of non-belonging that have a monopoly on this enjoyment. The enjoyment of non-belonging is actually available to everyone because no one can assuredly belong. And recognizing this universality of non-belonging is, I want to claim, the emancipatory project. So by privileging the enjoyment of non-belonging, emancipation tries to make clear the universality of non-belonging, which is again, I think the key to universal emancipation. Rather than continuing to emphasize the distinction between those who belong and those who don't, the emancipatory project emphasizes that there is no belonging, that all belonging is an illusion sustained only through this contrast with non-belonging. I think this is what Banan is actually getting at when he describes the moment of emancipation when the colonized subject ceases to believe in the colonizer's difference. At this point, the figure of non-belonging sees that belonging is illusory. And this is the move that the colonizer has to make as well. To give up the sense of belonging is the only path to emancipation. And the leftist movement works through an identification with figures of non-belonging that attempt to make evident the universality of non-belonging and thus realize the emancipatory project. So the more one invests oneself in belonging, the more one experiences the inadequacy of recognition and the failure of belonging. And this is why those who strive to belong constantly need to refer and emphasize the non-belonging of others. The left, in contrast, I think, enjoys the social order's internal failure. So no matter what the structure of the social order is. So for the left, the aim is to occupy the position of impossibility where the social contradiction occurs. And it's inherently universal. Why? Because it doesn't rely on an enemy. I think there's no leftism with an enemy. But the right, I think it rejects the impossible contradiction and attempts to assert social belonging through the figure of the enemy that is absolutely necessary. So I think the contrast between right and left enjoyment 
is nicely evident in the slogans chanted at rallies during the Trump presidency. So at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which was occasioned by bringing uh, the, possibly bringing down a Robert E. Lee statue, a Confederate leader statue. On August 11th, 2017, protesters chanted a couple of things. Uh, Jews will not replace us, include, and they also chanted blood and soil. <laughs> so obviously a revival of Bluten Boden. Uh, the Nazi watchwords. So this refrain, I think, typifies the rightest form of enjoyment because what does it do? It identifies an enemy that gives a pro the protesters a sense of their own belonging since it marks a threat to that belonging, the threat of replacement. The enemy makes their position of belonging an enjoyable one. So they're, they're parasitically enjoying through that figure of the non-belonging enemy. They, they enjoy through those whom they fear will replace them. And without the enemy to chant about, they wouldn't have come to the rally. That's absolutely clear. I think I, I think it's interesting to contrast this with the protest in 2020, uh, the massive protests against the police murder of George Floyd, which is a nice, I think, leftist contrast, even though all the protesters were not obviously leftists. So what's interesting is demonstrators here didn't say, the police will not replace us. What did they say? They said, I can't breathe which were the words of the dying George Floyd, right? So the difference between the slogan of Charlottesville and that of Minneapolis, which is where Floyd, Floyd's murder took place, encapsulates, I think, the difference between rightist and leftist politics. That the protesters identified themselves with the figure of non-belonging, who the police killed precisely because they viewed him through the lens of his non-belonging, which thus the I can't breathe statement. For the police, George Floyd did not belong, which is why an officer could crush his throat without any compunction. The leftist movement that arose in the wake of Floyd's death focused on this non-belonging and attempted to reveal its universality, thus the chant, to force in so doing those who felt secure in their belonging to see themselves in George Floyd and not in the police choking the life out of him. That was the key way to, that they were trying to change how people saw the event. So the rallies that took place in the wake of Floyd's murder demonstrated, I think, a leftist enjoyment. People were not People were protesting an unjust structure by aligning themselves with the person crushed by it. The enjoyment didn't require an enemy to attack, but occurred through the assertion of universal non-belonging. And I think it's absolutely crucial that emancipatory, an emancipatory movement doesn't militate, sorry, that, that does not militate for universal belonging. That is, there can be no emancipatory attempt to bring all those who don't belong within the social order because the sense of belonging can't be universalized. No matter how many people we include, belonging will always require some who don't belong and have to be outside in order to affirm the belonging of those who do. So if a movement argues for no be more belonging, we know it's inherently impossible to universalize and thus at least implicitly a conservative movement. That there's, to put it this way, there's no emancipation of the particular. So the rightist, attempt to forge belonging for a particular group, I think always founders on the problem of contradiction that undermines belonging. So no matter how much belonging the right-wing movement creates, it's never enough. So there's always an attempt to get more and more and more, whereas the left has a problem because it can never rely on belonging at all. And this is, I think, why leftism has nothing to hold people together other than their commitment to a shared failure to belong and the enjoyment that this failure provides and so in a way, the tenuousness of the leftist bond is at once the source of its enjoyment. I wanna conclude with, with the, trying to make evident the contrast between rightist and leftist enjoyment in the arena of comedy, although perhaps not in the way that one might initially think. It's not the case, unfortunately, I wish this were true, that leftists were always funny and rightists just lack a sense of humor or even the converse that that rightists are funny and the politically correct leftists can never make a joke. I don't think things are quite so clear cut. I think we can actually look at jokes and determine which are right and left. And I think if we look at the right ones, we can see how the form of enjoyment gets made evident by the joke. So I think there's, in this sense, there's a basic political division or distinction operating in comedy. So what happens? So right-wing jokes operate according to a strict opposition between belonging and non-belonging, just like right-wing enjoyment does. So this type of joke identifies a contradiction within the enemy who doesn't belong and finds the humor in it, but it leaves the friend, I'm using Carl Schmitt's distinction, it leaves the friend or the, the person telling the joke free from any evident contradiction. So a joke isn't conservative, I don't think, 
contrary to popular opinion, just because it punches down. Uh, instead, the conservative dimension of the right wing joke uh, derives not from who it who it targets, sorry, but but from whom it insulates from contradiction. That's where conservatism lies. So right wing comedy has those who belong that it refuses to make fun of. A genuine leftist comedy, I think, accepts no such restrictions, but sees the comedy of contradiction everywhere, universally. So the right wing structure of a joke becomes apparent if we look at any anti-communist joke. I have a couple here. So the first one goes like this. What's the best way to kill communists? The answer, communism. Okay. So here's another one. What do communists have before candles? The answer, electricity. So okay, they're not bad. They're kind of funny. So what these jokes correctly, I think, apprehend the self-destructive manifestation of obviously of actual communist experiments in the 20th century. But they're right-wing jokes because they postulate the communist as an enemy that succumbs to contradiction, whereas the communist is left, or sorry, another one great slip, the anti-communist is left intact, right? So although the joke apprehends how communism undermines itself, or at least has done so historically, it leaves the anti-communist undivided, positions communism in the position of the enemy to be annihilated, destroyed, or to be relegated to barbarism. So we know this is a right-wing joke because it preserves the anti-communist position as a position free from any contradiction. So rightist enjoyment confines itself to those who belong, to those who aren't communists. Think about this joke, or these jokes. While communists in the jokes suffer from contradiction, the anti-communist telling the joke doesn't. Instead, they enjoy through the contradiction that undermine, undermines communism while insulating the teller from this contradiction. This form of enjoyment, I think, is necessarily particular and cannot accede to the universal, right? Because it can't include the communists that it's making fun of. Uh, if it were to become universal, it would lose the exclusivity that gives it its right wing hue. And through this insistence on belonging, rightist enjoyment depends on the enemy that its jokes turn into a source of mockery. And a mockery correctly identifies lack in the enemy. The problem is that it leaves the subject itself unstained by contradiction, which is why it's not mocking enough. Uh, so leftism, in contrast, finds enjoyment within its own contradiction. And this enjoyment is universal because in here in every identity. So the fundamental contradiction that animates leftist politics is the insistence on universal non-belonging that leaves the position of belonging empty, as I've tried to make the case. So structurally, there's a position of belonging, no one can occupy it. So this dynamic is, I think, inherently humorous and lends itself to jokes. And I want to look at one. This is one of my all-time favorite jokes. So I hope you think it's funny. And if you don't, if you've heard it before, sorry. And if you don't think it's funny, that makes me very sad. So, uh, so here's what happens. So a visitor arrives at a monastery to investigate what life is like at the monastery, right? So one of the monks feels bad for him, agrees to act as his guide and to explain the idiosyncratic ways of the monastery to the visitor. So dinner time comes. The monk takes the visitor to this large dining hall. They start to eat. And then all of a sudden, a random monk yells out, 15. And the whole hall erupts with laughter. And the visitor, he's like totally perplexed. He's like, what is happening? What's this bizarre ritual? And he asks the guide for some kind of explanation. The guide says, here's the thing. We've all been together for so long that we know all the jokes that everyone tells. So rather than going through the trouble of explaining a whole joke, we just use the shortcut of a number. And the guy, the, the, the visitor's like, okay, I get it. And so just after this explanation, another monk yells out, 56. But this time the laughter is a little more subdued. And this perplexes the visitor again. He's like, what, what happened? And the guy goes, look, it's simple. That joke just wasn't as funny as the first one. And by this time, though, the visitor thinks, hey, I've kind of got the hang of it. And he wants to try his hand at telling a joke. So he shouts out, 125. And then the dining hall just explodes in even more laughter than that occasioned the first joke. And the visitor says to the guide, well, I must have told a really funny one. And the guy responds, well, actually, we hadn't heard that one before. And so what's, what's fascinating about this joke, I think, is that it recounts laughter at an empty space. So everyone laughs at a joke that no one knows, right? So the joke allows the listener to join in the laughter at a joke that doesn't exist. So the monastery joke, I think, provides the perfect paradigm for leftist enjoyment because there is no one who knows the joke that provokes the laughter in everyone, right? The group that belongs, those who know the joke, is empty. 
Everyone laughs, but no one knows the joke that they are collectively laughing at. No one belongs, although there is a universal non-belonging. Even the monks who've lived their whole lives at the monastery inhabit the same position of non-belonging because the joke, they don't know it any more than the visitor does. The non-belonging is not, however, a new form of belonging precisely because there's no one excluded from it. It's a non-belonging that doesn't require anything or anyone to oppose itself to, but rather uses belonging as a formal position with which to distinguish its universality. So the enjoyment in the monastery joke doesn't depend on anyone in the position of the enemy. The adversary is a form, not a content, an absence rather than an identifiable enemy. So the left enjoys what is not there, just like the joke that the visitor to the monastery tells. The non-existence of the joke, I think, corresponds to the number that he yells out. And this, we laugh together, I think, hopefully, at the impossible position that the joke itself occupies and the contradiction that this implies. In leftist comedy, there's no position immune to the reach of contradiction because what leftism is the enjoyment of contradiction. That all, in some, in some sense, no one need bar, be barred from it for someone to experience. Some don't have to suffer so that others can enjoy. All suffer so that no one is excluded from enjoyment. And I think the contrast between the monastery joke and the anti-communist joke is the nicely shows like, to me the contrast between left and right enjoyment. And as the contrast suggests, right and left aren't so much opposed ways of looking at the world, but opposed structures of enjoyment. And if right-wing political activity has an inherent advantage over leftism, it consists in what? The facility with which the right can structure a path to enjoyment. It's always easy to identify an enemy, I think, while it's much more difficult to recognize absence as the source of enjoyment. But left-wing enjoyment must sustain the embrace of contradiction that produces universal non-belonging. The alternative is always easier because it transforms contradiction into opposition, gives us someone to fight against, someone to hate. But by giving us someone to hate, right-wing enjoyment enables us to avoid confronting our own contradictory position. But contradiction, I think, nonetheless appeals to us because it is the source of an all enjoyment, even the conservative form of enjoyment that translates it into opposition in order to make it more digestible. So my idea is laugh at the monastery joke, don't laugh at the anti-communist joke. That's it. Well, thank you, Todd, um, sure. very, very much for this um, uh, wonderful, dense, intense, and funny um, paper and lecture. We already have one question in the chat that came in. No, I think already two. Um, so let's begin with Alan's. Um, um, and please raise your hand if you want to come in, right? I mean, you can also just, just uh, oh, we have a hand raised. Okay, wonderful. So I'll go through the chat and then and two hands raised. It's um, exploded. Okay, so first question, what about the example of the emperor in Japan between the first and second world wars? Is that in that brief time, the emperor was viewed as a living god by most, if not all, of our populace. So would their, would their social position not be most secure? I don't think so. I think that, uh, yeah, I think like the, the, I mean, it's more secure than someone who's not viewed as a living god. But I think, I think what that misses is the way in which the, the, that, that, Maybe it's not even because I think it misses the way in which the higher your position is, the more quickly things can turn for you, right? Like I think at any point, the the social structure can reverse its valuation of somebody of, of someone who's considered to be at the high point at the acme of belonging. Like I don't think that there's, I don't think that there's any security in that at all. I I I, I I'm pretty convinced of that. That there's no like the the, the ability of of the of the collective sensibility to completely change its valence. It seems to me that's that's constantly a possibility. Okay, let's right now go with um, Dijan. Um, if I if I mispronounce the name, I'm very sorry. And then we move back to the chat and where my colleague Udine Sabah uh, had put two questions. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much uh, for your talk. Um, I would have. Uh, just two more superficial or general questions over the scope of the explanation. So I really like this uh, focus on uh, enjoyment as it helped me to, uh, at some points during the political events of the past four years, I felt sometimes, um, I wanted to ask you, 
uh, to say something on the relation between enjoyment and political or economic interests. So sometimes I felt uh, this explanation thrown around that people are voting against their own interests, right? And often when I saw that at like big political campaigns, either with Trump or with uh, on democratic sides with Clinton and Biden, I felt like, are they really voting against their own interest? Because it's not about some particular policy point that might not come true uh, the way it is promised, but uh, the entire community and enjoyment and all that is already delivered, right? And that's where I feel like uh, I, I was, I, I feel like there's a real point to this, that um, the, in, the interest is not the interest that people have in mind who claim that people vote against their own interests. Same on the liberal side uh, with Biden, that uh, where he wouldn't like even promise something that leftists would want to, but it's still about something else, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that is uh, enjoyable about this. So this is my my first question about the relation to what is actual uh, interest here that would be dispassionate. Um, because I saw that also in conversations with either Trump supporters I know or conspiracy theorists I know, um, there is a genuine joy in doubling down on an impossible position. Yeah. Why would you think that it's like, who would want to double down on an impossible position? But there's genuine joy, right? Sometimes also we think, we think like, are they biting a bullet uh, here just to stick with their own side of matters? But some bullets maybe taste well, right? There, there's fun in biting some bullets. Um, so this is like what I observed here. And so I wanted, my second question is, what cannot be explained by reference to enjoyment in political human behavior? Um, how, what is the scope of the explanatory, uh, what is the explanatory scope of your proposition? Because I would say, at least oftentimes when I voted and participated in, in political processes, I did so at great displeasure at the options that I had. Uh, so this was not about enjoyment in many cases. And I also wouldn't want to explain too much of, for example, a protest uh, against Floyd's murder as coming from a place of enjoyment, right? I'm sure that there is something like that in there, but um, enjoyment cannot uh, show. So what is the scope of the, the explanatory scope of seeing political action and participation for the category of enjoyment? Thank yeah, you. those are great. Thank you. Those are great questions. So just the first one, I mean, I think it depends on how you define interest, right? Like I think enjoyment comes through the sacrifice of the good. So I think a lot of a lot of liberal commentators like you referenced will say those people are voting against their own good, their own interest. But that's precisely how they're getting their enjoyment structured. So I think that's right. Like when you said biting the bullet and doubling down on that. Yeah, of course, right? Like the more, that's why the more, and I, I think especially this goes for the figure of the expert, like the more that your position counters that of expert belief. And, and because I think the expert is aligned totally with the with the idea of the good or self or interest, right? And, and so I think enjoyment always runs counter to that. So the more like like here, Anthony Fauci became this spokesperson for how what is the self interested good response to the pandemic, right? And so so Trump was able to to use him as a figure to increase the enjoyment of his followers by constantly deriding him, precisely because we could renounce the good, we could renounce interest. So I guess my way of seeing it would be that interest is precisely what we give up in order to enjoy, right? The good is precisely what we give up in order to enjoy. Now, I'm prepared to bite the bullet on this second question. Like, I think enjoyment is universal. Like, I think it's, and I don't think it's, like, I think to say that the the Floyd, the anti-Floyd protesters were motivated by enjoyment is not to say that they weren't motivated by freedom and equality and solidarity, because I think those are all ways in which that those values have their basis in the structure of enjoyment, because if enjoyment is centered around the figure of non-belonging, then, then that's the basis for our, our value of equality. That's the basis of freedom. So I'm, I'm prepared to say like, it's a universalist explanation. I guess the, the example that's a little more difficult for me is when you said like, I, cause I have experiences too, obviously going to the ballot box and having like just choices that I find unappealing. Uh, 
and and I think you're like at that point you're right. Like it's not so much a form of enjoyment as like how to stave off what you think is a disaster. So I think maybe that's a limit. Like you're you're trying to just you, you, that you know in a way it's kind of like reality principle in, intrudes at a certain point, I guess. But I but I, I'm prepared to I'm prepared to say like no, it's like there's a I do think that it is it provides a way to think about political action in a way that that does encompass equality, freedom, solidarity, like all the val all the values that that the left is fighting for. Thanks, Todd. So yeah. my um, colleague, Kundina Selbach, put two questions in the chat. She first thanks you for your interesting discussion of set of contrast between structures of enjoyment. She can't access her camera at the moment. So the first question is, does a project of universalizing the enjoyment of non-belonging risk alighting the force of different modes of non-belonging? I am thinking of the way that different subjects and communities themselves are differently situated in relation uh, to the contradiction of non-belonging and indeed live these contradictions differently. So might differently enjoy or indeed not enjoy differently. And the second question is, what about left political project organized and mobilized and animated around killing joy? I'm thinking, for example, of Sarah Ahmed's work, how might a project of collecting round figure, um, collecting round figure of kill joy relate to enjoyment of non-belonging you describe? Yeah, that's a great one. I, I, I like the feminist kill joy. I'm going to answer the second one first because I, 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 can, I think I can answer it better. Uh, yeah, I think that to me, the feminist killjoy is a figure of enjoyment. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I think that, and I, I, I love that figure of enjoyment like that. And I think in a way like that, what she's, it's like, a, I would just call it, I mean, I like, I like the notion of a killjoy, but it's a kind of a feminist kill pleasure, right? Like she's killing that masculinist pleasure. So I, I, I think that that's, that to me is precisely uh, a, a, a figure of, 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 of leftist enjoyment. So yeah, I mean, so again, I think there's a difference between joy and enjoyment, which is important. Uh, I don't, I, I guess I, I don't, I'm not, I, I've no desire to ally the particular differences. Like I think that, yeah, I mean, that's, that. I think that's true. And I think it's true that particular, you know, they're, they're, they're different particular subjects live out contradiction differently. Um, but I don't, I, I think, I guess I don't see what's, I don't think there's an emancipate, emancipation of the particular, I guess. I don't, I don't see that. I don't, I don't see how that's possible. Like I don't, I, I don't, in other words, I don't see how there's an emancipation possible without reference to some kind of universal value. And even when I, I, I hear people that, cause I think for one thing, I think it's mostly a liberal position, but when I hear people articulate that, I think like, well, where, where does the value come from that you're asking other people to respect this particularity? Well, it comes from some kind of universality, which is, I don't think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, I think it's a mistake to think that that's a, that universality is in somehow like European or something. I don't think, I don't think universality is, has any, I think the whole point of it is it's non-placed, right? So it, so it, 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 it animates from, any from any from the struggle itself. So I don't, I guess I don't, I, 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 I think yes, like we need to be cognizant of the particular differences, but I don't think that um, there can be an emancipation of the particular. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, Zanan, do you want to kind him? Of... Oh. Hi, um, thanks. Thanks a lot for the, for the very, very interesting talk. Um, your your examples and and especially what what you uh, said at the end just brought me um, to a question about somehow a missing dimension in all this. I I, I would like to uh, hear what you think about. It. And the the um, missing dimension is the political the political economical dimension, and I mean with it that um, in your recent um, in your recent um, examples about left and right enjoyment in U.S. The question that I asked myself was in a from a Hegelian perspective. Well, we are talking about from a um, right and left enjoyment, but we need a third term, which just precedes them and in a way just uh, makes makes this juxtaposition possible. And I will just uh, think um, just um, remaining a kind of in in the in the in the way. Badiot, uh, Alan Badiot talks about in, in his recent seminars, 
from a kind of, uh, it's not only the only one who is talking about it, but from a shrinking of middle class. So maybe I thought it is maybe this, this third term that we, that we could just um, need will be the, the enjoyment of what Alain Badiou calls the uh, Occidental East. And, then, and there is one, uh, one, one very important thing that, that you told at the, um, at the end, you just said you defined an uh, emancipatory maxim as non-belonging. But mm -hmm. then I thought that, it's, that uh, the recent phenomena that we see makes this, um, makes this supposition a little bit um, challenging because if you just look at the maxim of late capitalism or the, the logics of belonging to middle class is, which is, a standardization of not belonging as the very sublime determination of belonging. What I mean is to belong to the middle class, I have to distinguish myself. To belong to the middle class, I, sh I show, I make a difference. To belong to middle class, I have to show through my choice of consumption or whatever I'm doing that I am not one of them. So I would just like to hear what you think about this um, third position and the logic of belonging to the middle class. and. Yeah. No, no, it's a great, it's a great question. And I think if I had, if I had willed enough time, I would have included, like, in, this is part of a book. And so there's a long discussion of capitalism. And I, I think that, you know, I, I mean, I see your point, I guess, but to, about the way in which capital, you have to dis distinguish yourself as, but I wouldn't say you distinguish yourself as non-belonging, I guess, like, you're still, the middle class is still structured around a striving to belong, right? So, and I think, I guess for me, capital, it, 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 it's inconceivable and that, that, that it's inconceivable around, structured around non-belonging. And so when I, like for, I, I guess I don't, I'm not sure I see a third term because the point would be that 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 non-belonging is inherently anti-capitalist. Like I think, and 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 the 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 way in which the middle class tries to distinguish itself, and I think the distinction is important. It's it's trying to gain some kind of recognition. Like, okay, yeah, the recognition is through like my idiosyncrasies or whatever, right? But but it's still about recognition. It's still about like finding some way to belong, even though it's like I I, I have a a student I saw couple days ago wore a shirt that said um i'm an outsider right like like okay i'm fine but like that's that's like you, you're that's exactly i think what you're talking about right like you're trying to like affirm that i belong by saying like oh i'm i'm an out but but that's a way of that's just a different path to belonging like i don't see that as a fun like i don't i mean it's to me that's something like fake non-belonging, right? Like the whole point is you're not that you're 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 not not looking for recognition. You're not looking for that validation of your own idiosyncratic particular difference. I mean, that's the term I think is important is particularity, right? Like the the difference between the the, the, the middle class you're talking about wants to affirm what not its singularity but precisely it's particularity. And that's like that shirt that I saw the student wearing. Like it's, it's all about how am I a particular? And, and to me, singularity is different because singularity requires the detour through the universal. And, that's, and that universality is I think also inherently anti-capitalist. And again, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to talk about it, but, but yeah, I don't think, like you're right. That was a real missing term in the talk, like political economy, I agree. Um, but that, that isn't a missing term in my whole way of laying this out. Like it, I, I really t take a lot of time because I think capitalism holds out the promise of belonging. Like that's the fun and belonging is asserted, I think in the, in the commodity form. Like I think the, the way in which the commodity form appeals is that it has this promise of belonging attached to it. And that's why we invest ourselves in it. So I think, I guess, I guess I think again, non-belonging to me is, insofar as it's universalist, it's inherently anti-capitalist because capitalism is necessarily particularist. And I think even the example of the middle class you used, I would just say that's just particularism run rampant. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Yeah. So Jonathan is uh, next. Please come in. Uh, hi there, Todd. Um, hi. 
long time listener of Y Theory, so this oh, is thanks. a big fanboy moment for me. Um, but also, uh, I'm, I'm glad you didn't wear the MAGA hat because, I mean, as you as you and I both know, um, your hat is still kind of very pregnant with meaning. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, I was just going to ask you a rather crude question, but maybe sure. one that is just, a, it's a nice point to defend. And I was just thinking about if we're talking about a kind of political project for the left, um, something that seems like it was always a very uh, obvious position for the left to take, but they don't always do, is against the billionaire class So for and the enjoyment of the billionaire class. Yeah. So for instance, you know, it's very easy to imagine uh, kind of constructing someone like Jeff Bezos as this kind of like one person out group, if you like, where, you know, we see the obscene enjoyment of him going to space and saying, well, I couldn't think of anything to do with the money when his personal wealth could pay off the debt of the Sud of the Sudan to the IMF or something. Um, but basically, would you think that any kind of leftist project that, for instance, kind of like as grotesque as the billionaire class is, if we just try and make them this outgroup that even though that seems like it would work from a, a real politique kind of position, does it not kind of deliver the kind of like, is it vacuous ultimately, I guess I would say. Yeah, Jonathan, it's a great question actually. Uh, and thanks for that. I, I, I think um, it's tempting, right? It's tempting to, um, to think like, well, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we, like the right is so effective at making the enemy, like why don't, and it, it's amazing really, right? Like, like there's this, how can there be a fantasy of, I'm talking about the Reagan era now, but it's, it continues in different terms. Reagan used to talk about the welfare queen and her like obscene enjoyment. And you're like, well, wait a minute, we could have a fantasy of that that's operative politically, but we can't have a fantasy of Jeff Bezos's obscene enjoyment and how that could mobilize us. Okay, so that, that I think you're right. There's something really tempting about that. I think it's here's why I think it's 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 the wrong tack to take because I think it ultimately is kind of giving in to that right wing form of enjoyment. And I think the other problem, and and this is ultimately I think the problem with it is that it makes it seem like that's something to aspire to. But I think the I think what should be clearer is look at the poverty of Bezos's existence. Like, I think that should be much more like, let's take the money away from him precisely because he can't even enjoy it, right? Like that seems to me to be what we should be saying. Like, look, he's so impoverished. You had to fly into the, to the, the atmosphere just or out of the atmosphere, just to, just to, just to find a little modicum of enjoyment. Let's like, we can enjoy his money a lot better than that. Let's just, so that's, I just think like, in a way, I feel like it gives the billionaire class too much credit to say that they've, that they're immersed in some kind of obscene enjoyment that they've taken from us. And I, 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 although I do understand the appeal of that, and, and I know Bernie sometimes will launch into that, like the billionaire class, and he'll kind of talk about it in those terms. But I do think that that's a, I love Bernie, but I think that I don't think that's a. I mean, I think the way we should talk about them is not about their obscene enjoyment, but precisely their failure to enjoy. And that I think is because that's the only way to structure the movement around the enjoyment of non belonging, I think. So, but great question. Great question. Thanks, Doug. I put myself on the list simply because I, I, I think I, I, I profit a lot if you clarified one point for me, because I had a question, I think, similar to that of Zanan and similar on the, from another perspective as um, the first one of Undine. I was thinking about this um, joke that Derrida liked and that Slavoj sometimes um, 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 tells, namely um, like three people in a, <clears throat> in a church, a, a rabbi, uh, a Jewish a rabbi, he falls onto his knees and says, I'm nothing, right? Dear God, uh, I'm nothing. A Jewish businessman stands up, falls onto his knees, and basically says, "I'm nothing to God." Oh, um, and then a poor guy, right, falls on a poor Jewish guy falls onto his knees and basically says, "I'm nothing." And the two others immediately go, "Who is he that he also thinks he's nothing?" Right. Okay. So that's the structure of the joke. I think my, my my first question was, "What do you make with that?" Right. That that one can specify nothing, specifies non-belonging, specify not belonging to 
even the ontological order, one could say. Um, and I think you already answered that by saying, well, there are fake ways of non-belonging that are ultimately about belonging and adequate ways of uh, non-belonging. But are there, let's say, historically specific and more pertinent ways of non-belonging in a historical situation? So is sometimes, let's say, I was thinking when you were saying, well, for a sexist society, or for um, a colonial society, right? Mm -hmm. For those societies, they are determined as colonial or sexist because these struggles are essential for them, right? That's correct. Um, so is then the huge debate that we right now also need to have um, a debate about what kind of society we're in? I mean, in the sense, is capitalism the, 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 the adjective, uh, adjective uh, the attribute that determines the specific form of non-belonging that is um, politically relevant? Or is it something else, right? I mean, because one can particularize non-belonging. I think that was Undine's point in, in, in yes, some sense, yes. right? So, um, um, and, and then the struggle begins, what kind of non-belonging in a particular situation has this, let's say, can stand as a bearer for with this uh, universal significance and can have a universal impact, right? Maybe this is just a question about political strategy, but yeah, maybe no, not. It is, yeah, it is. It's a great question, right? Like, so just about the joke first, because I think in a way, isn't the point of the joke, I mean, I understand that the point of the joke kind of separates their nothingness, right? But, but in a way, the whole point of the joke, I think is that to undermine the first two people, right? Like it's a kind of like a good Samaritan story, right? Like the first two positions are what they don't understand is, yeah, they're, no, they're real. You really are nothing. Sorry. Like that's the, so I think that's what's funny about it. And so I guess that's how I want to answer the other question too. Like I want to say, well, wait a minute. Like, no, like the, the non-belonging, it's inherent in every single position. And so I think that's the, to me, that's the crucial thing that then you universalizes and unites right and so again that's why I, i'm I, well i do accept like obviously like there's oppression is particular all these like like all of course but the the emancipatory project is universal so i think that's and and you're right like it does depend on who or who's going to stand in for that position of non-belonging sure right like like it was there was a great moment in the U.S. when there's Black Lives Matter, and then there was this attempt to like say, well, okay, Latino lives matter too, and then everyone was like, no, 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 you missed the entire point of the movement, right? And so I loved that 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 never caught on, like that uh, that 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 they just like to say that like once you then like because they tried to turn what was an inherently universalist movement into a it's okay it's one just one list of particulars. What's interesting is Judith Butler also criticized all lives matter by saying all lives matter jumps to the universal too quickly. And I'm like, no, 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 no. They've jumped to the particular, like they jumped away from the universal, right? And so I think your your point is is good in the sense that like it does matter, but I don't it, it that you have to locate like the where the site of the universal non-belonging is gonna be articulated from. Yes, but I almost think it doesn't matter. Like, I almost think like, it doesn't like, is it gonna be Black Lives Matter? Or is it gonna be like, was it in, in 1804, wasn't the Haitian revolution? Yeah, you know, yeah, but it didn't, it could have been, you know, it could have been like, like it could have been the Algerian war. It could be like, I think it, there could be any, you could take any point and then make it. And so I'm not, because precisely because that non-belonging is universalized. And so like, and then this comes back to the question about Bezos too, I think, right? Like, I know, I think it's a real mistake to think like, oh, Bezos has some, and, and the thing about the Japanese emperor, like they have some kind of secure identity then they're fully, no, like they're just, I don't want to say like, oh, the poor little rich boy, like Richie Rich or something, but I do want to say like, it doesn't matter how secure your position is, you're still cut by this your your belonging is still insecure and it could it could all be lost in an instant like right like you could you could lose your fortune on wall street you could have to jump out the building right like like the, i think that's an important thing because that that sense of the universal has to run through everyone in that sense but yeah it's a great question no thanks thanks so much Doug. um jm please come in. 
Okay. Oh, and first of all, uh, I would like to, one second, I'm trying to unraise my hand. Um, okay. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to apologize for coming in late. Uh, I live in central Colorado where the internet is very, very, it does whatever it wants, basically. So by sheer coincidence, it dropped out right when, like this morning. And so I couldn't get in uh, when we started. And so I apologize. I feel like I'm kind of I, ironically enough, it, it kind of fits uh, into your subject. It I does. feel like I'm, it's non <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, right. but I'm actually a huge fan of your, I, I've been subscribed to your YouTube channel ever since like you basically started posting. And so I'm a big fan of your work. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to actually send you an email yesterday, but I thought I'd just tell you about it in this. Is, it, it may sound weird. I, I, forgive me if it feels like it has nothing to do with what you've just talked about because and to be frank, I don't know what you talked about because you know I wasn't here. Um, but uh, I, was, I was interested in your opinion on the role. It's, it's also sort of may strike you as sort of a banal question, but you know, I, I know you're sympathetic as am I and most of us here, I imagine, to sort of the Libuana Hegel scholars, right? And you know, what makes, at least according to your own talks, right, what you think makes them distinct from a lot of um, other, you know, you know, within, what makes them distinct within the tradition of Hegel scholarship is this sort of affirmation, as you put it, uh, of contradiction, as opposed to this fixation uh, as the standard sort of like way Hegel's taught, you know, if he's taught at all, you know, in like American universities, right, which is to say, like, you know, he's a philosopher resolving or overcoming, or if you want to be, you know, precise and technical, right, sublating contradiction. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought, you know, about this in terms of, um, you know, I've always been very interested, is, is it actually this book, I'm very interested in writing, I wanted to see if you could have maybe some input on this, I'm not sure though, it might be out of your, you know, um, I mean, it may not like pique your interest or anything, but I've always been sort of very interested in how like, it sounds sort of like random, but how someone like a... <laughs> Sounds crazy. Uh, the, I've always been interested in how the political philosophy of, um, you know, uh, of the, the Chinese famous Chinese revolutionary uh, Mao Zedong <laughs> relates to this actually contemporary turn in Hegel scholarship. It seems like out of nowhere. But what I think is interesting is that um, there's this debate within the Marxist circles and within like scholarship surrounding the history of like Marxist revolutionary movements around the figure of Mao Zedong because he is sometimes criticized and during his lifetime was criticized by some Soviet like scholars and philosophers for rejecting the negation of the negation. Mao Zedong famously in certain articles actually rejected this concept and a lot of people criticized him you know and like I know I'm dealing with a very controversial figure here I'm not talking about you know him on a personal level or him on a policy level you know, I'm not trying to praise or condemn him in that regard. I'm just talking about in terms of his contribution to dialectics as philosophy, right? There's right. this interesting theme in Mao where he he rejects the notion of negation and negation. He says, like, you know, the only law of contra of dialectics is the unity of opposites. And what's sort of interesting is the standard interpretation, right, is one in which um, a lot of people interpret this as Mao orientalizing Marxism. Like if you write, if you read some books commentating on Mao's uh, famous text, you know, political uh, text on contradiction, they say like what he's trying to do, right? He's trying to inject sort of ancient Chinese concepts from ancient Chinese philosophy into like dialectic. Um, and, you know, ultimately what you get with Mao is like this orientalized version of dialectic because, um, for Mao, you know, Mao says contradiction is eternal, it's infinite. He has weird quotes you can find from him where he says, like, you know, a thousand years in the future, even once we become fully communist, there will still be contradictions amongst the masses. And he has all these quotes. And, you know, the standard reading, like I said, is that, you know, um, this is just him, like, having, like, a, a oriental, orientalizing, you know, Marxism and Hegelian dialectics. But I'm wondering, like, maybe if there's a certain way it's a book project I'd like to do once I finish my dissertation, where I'm wondering if there's a certain way you could try to reconcile. I mean, I'm not sure if it's possible. I mean, I'd like to know if it's possible, whether you could reconcile a certain interpretation of Hegelian dialectics, similar you know, to the one you're proposing, yeah. right, where there's this affirmation of contradiction with this idea that, you know, Mao Zedong 
articulated in relation to his philosophy of political practice, where contradictions beget further contradictions, you know, infinitely. And, you know, of course, he used it, you know, I mean, we Thanks, can debate the how he used this idea, yeah. right? Yeah, but, Cheyenne, that's right. No, I, I think that that's, I think it's interesting, because I've had other people have, have after my book on Hegel came out, other people have said, it's interesting that you did incite on contradiction, where Mao says precisely, in a way, what I say, that contradiction is eternal, that every social order is going to be inhabited by contradiction, and that what I said in this talk, like that, 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 that leftist enjoyment is precisely the enjoyment of contradiction. So, yeah, I don't think that's, I, I wouldn't say it's orientalizing. The only thing I would say is, what does Mao exactly mean by contradiction? So I do think you're right to say that there's a way in which the Slovene interpretation of Hegel, specifically Slavoj's interpretation of Hegel, does does and it's not a surprise that Slavoj edited an edition of, of of Mao's Mao's book, right? with yeah, the preface. Yeah. yeah, right. So I think that it's, I think the only question is, and I think it would be something to work out is what does he mean by contradiction? And I think does he mean something like the unity of opposites, or does he mean, which is what I think Hegel means, the way in which every identity is internally split, right? Like, I think those, I'm not sure that, I, I think that would have to be worked out because I think it's, I think Mao leans more toward this idea that every, there's there are all these grand oppositions that create conflict that are the source of conflict and that they, they're, that's what's eternal. But Hegel's point about what's eternal is the split within every entity, like every entity is internally split, right? And I think that that, right. It seems to me like there is some difference on that, but I, but nonetheless, I think it's an interesting project to think about how Mao's notion of eternal contradiction fits in with this new reading of Hegel. So I, I do think that there is something to that. I just would, my my caution is just in this one direction, right? Like that that I, yeah. I I'm not exactly sure that Hegel and Mao mean exactly the same thing by contradiction. Thanks, Don. Yeah. No, there's I mean, another question. Sorry. Uh, there's another question in the chat. Um, uh, that I, So, um, Alan says, um, I was just wondering, based on your talk and your answer to Dijan's second question, is another possible limit of enjoyment as a universalist explanation be the notion of a modern society? I'm wondering how well enjoyment operates as an explanation for politics in tribal societies, such as the Sentinelese or North Sentinel Islands, or even historically in the sense of nomadic or established societies like the Uman Manda, Scythians or Mongols. <laughs> That's a good, I'm tempted oh. not to say anything because I, <laughs> I, I shouldn't talk about what I don't know about. Uh, but I, 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 I don't know. I mean, is it, is it a specifically modern question? I don't think so because I think, look, wherever, I, I, I think, you know, Mark said this, that, 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 you know, that there, what the, the movements of history reveal earlier moments in history and what was at work there in ways that weren't apparent, that were implicit, but weren't apparent. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's true of modernity. Maybe it's not. I do. The only thing I would say is if you're, if, if, if we're talking about speaking beings, then enjoyment is, a, is like the logic of right and left enjoyment. I can see that being not being a specifically modern thing, but I think if we're talking about speaking beings, then the enjoyment is a structural phenomenon, right? So it's not like, it's not like, oh, uh, the, there, there was this society that didn't have, no, like, of course, like, it, it, if there's a structure of signification, then there's a position of enjoyment. So I, I the only thing I, I would say is that I do think, like, is the, is the, I, 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 I'm tempted to say that the right, the whole divide between, obviously the divide between right and left stems from the, from revolutionary France, but but even as terminal, terminologically. Uh, but I, I don't know that I would say that that has a pre or a, a non-modern uh, hold. I don't, I don't know about that. I, I, so I, I, I don't have a good way to answer that question. Thanks, Todd. I think that was the last question. Um, that was wonderful um, and very intense. Um, uh, thank you for all this energetic um, responses and wonderful, consistent replies. Um, it was a pleasure having you, at least virtually. Yeah, um, Frank, it, um, thank you so much for having me. And it was so enjoyable for me.
Um, I hope we can get you to Scotland at one point. I would like to go sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Todd. Right. Okay. I sent you the recording. Thank okay, you so thank much you. for being Thanks here. Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care.